Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name, my full name is Fresh Lev White and I go by Fresh or Lev. So whatever is easier for you, people know me as both. Um, and I'll probably be Lev soon, but um, I'm always, Fresh is always welcome. And <clears throat> I may have mentioned uh, the last time I was here that um, I met um, Gussie through the, let's see which program we met at the Community Dharma Leadership Program at Spirit Rock. So back in 2015. And then Gussie and I and one other person um, who may have who may have come here. Um, uh, wow, I can't remember her name right now. But anyway, we also walked in the doors the opening night of what was against the stream back in the day. And so it's just nice to see the progress. And um, this space is much more comfortable. That place was beautiful, but this place is much even more beautiful and, um, and much more cozy. So it's an honor to be here tonight. And I like to, one of the, so the two things that I focus on mostly are Sangha and self-compassion um, in either order. And I'd love for people to just take a moment and say hello to each other. So maybe you can say your name. You don't have to turn on your camera if you don't want to, but you can just say your name and um, maybe if you'd like where you are and maybe um, one thing that's on your heart today or your heart this evening. So for and pronouns, so example, my name is Lev. My pronouns are he, they, and love. And I think we talked about that last time. And um, I'm coming here from Oakland, also a lonely land. And um, what's on my heart is um, hoping that I um, teach something different than a lot last time because it was a long time ago, which means you may have also forgot, which is cool. So um, yeah, anybody else want to say hi to everybody? All right, so um, thank you all for sharing and um, connecting and welcome to our visitor to our planet called the San Francisco, sort of its own planet. You ready to practice? Shall we practice a little? 30 minutes. Begin by finding comfort, whatever that might be for you at this time, as you can assess it. And if they're available, noticing the feet, if you can find the sensations in your feet, meeting anything with kindness, including numbness, or no sensation at all, just being kind, coming up and filling our legs, coming up to our thighs and waist, and perhaps we can feel the weight of our body on the planet. And then noticing our back and seeing if it's a way to make it comfortable. And then if we can't get comfortable, can we be kind to ourselves and our body around that. And then our abdomen, I should just say belly, it's so much easier, um, at ease. Noticing the rising and falling of our chest and belly. And then noticing if there's stuckness and you don't have to do anything about it. Just notice the body will take care of itself. If you're breathing in full or whatever that is for your system. And coming up to the shoulders, notice them rising and as you release, allowing your elbows to fall towards the ground.
Perhaps if they're available, noticing sensations in your arms and hands. And again, exhaling, allowing your upper back to fall, your body to fall. And just notice the weight of your body on the earth. And we might imagine a gentle touch, or maybe it's water coming up the back of your neck towards your scalp allowing release and ease. Letting go of your forehead, your brow, releasing the tiny muscles around your nostrils, eyes. the bigger nostrils of your jaw, allowing ease and relax. Just checking your tongue. And as needed, you might experience this exhale as releasing to the hug of the planet. You get three hugs here. As we go into our practice, remembering that it is a practice, our mind wanders, and we can gently bring it back and begin again. No need for judgment. Perhaps being glad you found it, being glad you noticed you wandered and simply come back. And anytime you can put your hand on your heart space or belly if you need care, just remembering one breath at a time, present, staying present.
gently returning to this moment, your body,
before we come back <clears throat> before we come back together taking a moment to honor yourself for showing up for your practice remembering it's only a practice the perfection isn't showing up May I honor myself for this practice, for taking the time. And if you have any to spare, offering gratitude for everyone in our hybrid circle, giving thanks for them to provide this container, especially our hosts online and offline, and everybody who they showed up for. May you honor yourself for showing up for your practice. And as our evening will continue after a short break, perhaps we can offer the merit of this practice towards our own hearts. May we accept and feel loved. May we know that we are loved by each breath, each inhale, and of course, by the Buddha who offered us the Dharma to teach us to love ourselves more deeply. Thank you for your practice. We'll take a little three minute stretch. Second. It's weird seeing myself on screen. Um, I think the room probably got it spotlighted. Oh, yeah. Oh. This was until seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You gonna hang out? Yeah. Cool. So you're visiting or you can live here? Yeah. It's like you have those seats out and it's sort of like this way. But oh, oh you're recording this. Oh, I'm so scrammed. Have you been here? I have. When I was in my early 20s, I biked here in Vancouver with some friends. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, but it's been a lot. Yeah. Yes. That's amazing. That's a, quite a journey. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Allison Bechtel, that's who you look a little bit like. Um, Hi, Craig. Yeah, 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 right? I'm pretty sure I'm thinking about the person in the, you know, the person with the glasses in Dykes to watch out for. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think that's Allison. I met, I met her at Michigan one year. 
Oh. Way, way back, 91. I'm old. Cool brag there. <laughs> What'd you say? That's a, that's a, that's a cool brag. Yeah, I met Alison Bechtel. I met Alison Bechtel. And then, um, what was her name? Diane Damasia, remember? Um, Hothead Pies on? Do you remember Hothead Pies on? Yeah. Before they was a, an option, right? Mm -hmm. So there can we can we you wrap this up there? I do, yeah. Okay, yeah, with the PC and the presentation today. I've been there but not to practice, so uh, should come out. I should come up. We're always hosting the energy. It's a Oh, wow. I was just there. Who was? Oh, nice. Just, I was just uh, on the weekend. Nice. And so you must know um, the trans anthology. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Right? I got to the library. I leaved through it. Right. Yeah, that's a Vancouver person. That's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Been... Whose name I can't remember. Yeah. Either. That's good though. I was so delighted that getting out of Texas. And somebody's working on another one. I think it's been three minutes. And I know I didn't teach you this. <laughs> um, I definitely have like my love hate relationship with the computer, <laughs> but um, I love trees. And so it's my option. So hope nobody's offended by it. This, uh, it's hard to call them teachings, but this, what I'm gonna, about to share um, was part of um, a, um, and I don't, there are all these words I don't like, but are, they're otherwise hard to dis describe, but I was able to, I had the honor of offering a sermon at a Seder um, a couple of weeks ago. And it really, and I felt, and so I've been sharing it in Buddhist spaces as well. I feel like um, the topics are relevant to everybody. So I'm gonna read some of what's here and, um, and hopefully it all lands for you. Listening and remembering, um, people's shares in the beginning and um, Tom talking a little bit about like this pull towards something that they're not quite sure of what it was. And um, I can feel, but I can't remember exactly what Tia said and the need for self-compassion that came. <clears throat> Nothing has changed and everything has changed when we look at our world. And yet I know I have changed. And here we are gathering while there is forced starvation in places in the world, Gaza and beyond. Hostages and families are held. 
There are lots of ways to respond to this moment, and we are choosing to lean into nourishing ourselves as a community spiritually so that we can continue to show up for ourselves and each other during this time of devastation. And um, in this way, intentional or not intentional, we're in Sangha, we're in spiritual community. I'm offering this teaching with the hope that one day we will all awaken to the magnificence of who we really are. We individually, we as community, we as the human race. May we wake to the fact that we simply can't survive without each other. All of the gifts, teachings, healings, blessings, and even humor we each have all come from the same source, life, creator, universe, spirit, our inner Buddha, and the list goes on, whatever names that you use for your higher power. Our mindfulness practice allows us to see and be with all that's happening with wise equanimity and wise understanding. The Dharma holds us so that we know when to step in and when to step away wisely from the news and the trauma. And hopefully we practice that. I will share with you some of the tools that I've employed to support me during these times. And I acknowledge these may not be right for you in this moment. You can take what works and leave behind what doesn't fit for you. I state this because sometimes we need permission to love and honor ourselves and our experience. So I begin by offering the idea or the, or the practice of acknowledging our grief. We are here together in this time, uh, sorry, we are here in a time when we are feeling tremendous grief and sometimes rage at the unneeded suffering of so many people around the world. For many of us, particularly in connection to the devastation in Palestine, Israel, particularly Gaza Rafa, um, each, each, each people's suffering there, the Congo, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, and the list goes on. The streets of many of our cities, our communities, and our families, our grief and disconnection. So many people are experiencing personal loss and change. We honor these, all of these, by grieving and all the ways this has affected our communities near and far. Our grief is too much to hold alone. We are here to hold it together. And we, in this moment, or maybe in your communities when possible, so I'd like to offer, I'm going to throw something in that I, something different that I did on Saturday in a compassion workshop and offer you an opportunity to give yourself a hug because we're grieving what we can't control sometimes. We're grieving what's painful. So we're going to do a hug. Let me model that for you. There you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. There you go. Taking a breath. Taking a breath. Just taking care of ourselves and honoring ourselves. And I'm going to move now towards empathy. Each of us has our own personal experiences impacted by many different factors. The violence in particular of the last seven months activate past and present traumas, fears, and concerns, and has pulled some of us apart. 
even internally? How can we flex our capacity for empathy? And empathy being our ability to recognize the ways that we're experiencing harm, fear, rage, and really being with it, being with it. Take a moment to think about someone with whom you have a different perspective. See if you can soften yourself into curiosity and perhaps even imagine for a moment that we might be like them with their constellation of relationships and memories. We might consider that no one is actually wrong if they're coming from fear, doubt, manipulation, propaganda. There's so much that we all have to take in and everybody wants to survive. And I'm not talking about opening yourself up to harm as, um, as we've learned, as we've learned, not opening yourself up to more harm, but opening yourself up to empathy, knowing what it's like to believe in something, grow fearful with it, and finding yourself alone. So may we continue or practice flexing and stretching a muscle of empathy including when it's hard and our empathy grows with practice and remember having empathy doesn't mean that you approve you agree it's just that you see the humanity of yourself and others compassion is empathy plus action says Brené brown it's the practice of relating to others and, as a result, acting to ease their suffering. An example of this, when we witness people being harmed and not having access to food, people rally and find ways to get sustenance to them through donations or direct action. How do you do that for yourself? If you're not acknowledging your pain, your fear, your anger, your grief, how can you take care of yourself? How can you have compassion for yourself if you're not willing to see how you're, how you're pained? Sometimes compassionate acts are as small as turning towards ourselves with kindness instead of animosity or getting ourselves water when we are thirsty rather than bypassing our needs. When, when we do these small acts, we are resourcing ourselves to show up for the bigger acts of compassion for our world. And when I think about I mentioned that the Buddha loves us, so the Buddha loves us through the Dharma. I always consider how much love and compassion had to go into all that, that the Buddha was teaching, all that they were offering, all of the teachers that have passed it down. And if they can have this compassion for us, this, this, um, hmm, I think the word would be like, as the Buddha said, um, this offering, right? Not a demand, but this offering, these offerings for us to wake up. How can we not have that compassion for ourselves? And think of one way you have acted with compassion for yourself or another in just these past few days or these few weeks. Maybe it was just from your heart. You didn't have to be with the person or says to yourself, but just remembering what that felt like. Remembering that experience. Oh, 
when we have compassion for ourselves, it becomes a resource for our healing, our growth, our expansion, our caring for others. And one of the ways, I don't know if I mentioned it last time, one of the ways to practice compassion is also to notice what we're taking in. I often challenge sanghas and people in sanghas to, before you turn on the news or Instagram, whatever it is, open the paper, to notice what's going on in your body. And several years ago, as I was turning on uh, Democracy Now! as um, an Amy Goodman, uh, one of the news, one of the ways that I get news, and I, I noticed that I was experiencing trauma in my body. I was just paying attention. And what I realized is anytime I turn on the news, I have a trauma response. And how often have we stepped over that response? How often have we not honored ourselves? And I've gone anywhere from two weeks to three years without watching the news. And I never lost track of anything because the world hasn't changed that much. And if there was something I needed to know and more than I needed to know, there was always somebody to tell me. People like to share the trauma. So I'd like to encourage the compassion practice of noticing when you're stepping over your trauma to, 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 to see, to, to figure out the news or whatever it is that's coming up. And then, so choosing compassion both, if you choose not to, because that will feel weird and hard, and some of us feel like we have to watch the news, we have to know what's going on, which is made up. But if you do, can you meet that with compassion? And if you don't, can you meet that with compassion? What if you can be kind to yourself either way, choosing the most compassionate um, path for that moment? So um, in the, at the Seder, we're actually, um, what I spoke to were, we, we were having wine. So now we're on the fourth glass of wine and um, we're feeling our pain and we're teary and some of us and um, and we're in the depth of it. And then we get to this fourth practice, this fourth and as important as the rest, which is joy. which is the opposite of grief. You may have heard um, uh, the prophet, um, I'm having a memory thing today, um, Halil Gibran talk about how the same well that holds our sorrow is the same well that holds our joy. And so when we go deep and really allow to feel the pain, to experience the suffering, when that transitions, right, everything is impermanent, we get to experience that much joy. And I remember coming to this understanding, I think it was 2019 or 2018 probably, and I was, um, I was in my... It's cyclical depression, and it was deeply up. And I remember saying, I remember saying, I can't wait to get to the other side because it's going to be so good, you know, because I was allowing it, you know, I was allowing myself to be in it. 
Joy is a way to be able to have grief, empathy, and compassion, to, a, a way to be able to hold it. Joy is the healing and animating force that helps us all, all to remember our aliveness. Let us keep striving towards our inherent right to express our experience of joy. And that comes out of and directly from where we began. There are people suffering. There will always be people suffering according to our Buddhist practice. There are people suffering right now. Somehow, all of us were born in this time and this place. Somehow. We have these privileges that we 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 can't name. I, and I was thinking as I was, I was coming out of meditation, how the mind is as wondrous as the holy universe, right? Nobody can actually figure out what's going on. So there are people who or any of us can get stuck in this idea of feeling guilty. And um, guilt doesn't support anybody. Guilt doesn't do anything. It, maybe it motivates some people, but mostly it's a narcissistic response to feeling like there's nothing that, that or it's a narcissistic response to like, oh, I have all these things, you know, I have all these privileges. Oh, poor me. And it's sort of like, instead, we can choose to live into joy and experience grief and and offer compassion to ourselves and others and have empathy. When we eat, we can remember that there are people who are hungry and spiritually or or in some mental way, invite them to eat with us. And we can pray that they eat as well. When we dance, we can do the same. But we do not not dance because, because we feel guilty. But instead, we live fully into this life. We live into the healing practices so that we can create the world that um, has less suffering, if, if any at all. Um, I, I tell this story often about you go to a memorial or a funeral and there are people in the corner cracking up. They're laughing really loud. Everybody looks at them. Five minutes later, they're all in tears. It's because they're present with each moment. And then when's the last time you asked yourself what brings you joy? When's the last time you asked yourself what would be joyful or fun for me? I really do believe in living into these privileges and creating, it's almost like, um, it, creating a vortex of healing and love, creating an energy of healing and love. When we look towards people who oppose us, our question is not, or our, we can blame and shame if we'd like, we can point the finger, or we can ask, where does any of that live inside me? Where does violence live inside me? Where does greed live inside me? Where does hate live inside me? And work towards healing that. It says here we're going to pass around a bouncy ball, but um, I didn't bring a ball. Oh, wait, this is kind of cute, though. All right, so maybe take a moment and think about what brings you joy? Take a moment and think about what brings you joy.
And in a couple of seconds, I'm going to mime a joy bouncy ball. And I'll toss it around. We'll do it the best we can. You might have to say names on the screen. And um, and we'll say what brings us joy. So for me, um, I got the ball. It's just as big, not too big. Not going to knock you out. It's pretty soft. Well, it's like a Nerf ball, only it's round. And uh, one of the things that brings me joy is definitely looking at the water, looking at the ocean. So I'm going to start online. Um, and uh, I'm going to throw this ball to my friend Tia because I can see her. And I, oh, great. We can hear you. One of the things that brings me joy is listening to music and remembering just how much I love all the music I've heard in my life and all of the music that is yet to be known to me. It's, it's so much, so joyous. But I am going to throw the ball to Julie. Whoosh. <laughs> okay. I already mentioned the beach and how important it is for me and my dogs. Um, but since you mentioned that already, I'm going to say enough money to throw a good party. Oh. So I don't have to worry about it. I got all the treats, all the <laughs> stuff. Right. Throw it to Quan. Uh, one of the things that brings me joy is going to dance class and walking in nature. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to give it to Kian. I have to one hand it because I'm walking. Okay. <laughs> I'm a professional imaginary ball catcher. And one of the things that brings me joy is I think that what's really cool is spending time with my kids and like being very present and seeing them grow, like their mm -hmm. transitions between adolescence and young adulthood and adulthood. Like it's very beautiful and it brings me a lot of joy. And I don't yeah. know who's in there in real life, so I don't know who to toss the ball to. <laughs> Um, anybody ready? We've got Mick visiting from out of town, Tom and Daniel, right? Wow, I did it. All right, Daniel, catch. <laughs> got it. <laughs> um, what brings me joy is having a bonfire with good friends. Mm. Pass it over to you. Daniel threw it to Mick. What brings me joy is my dog, especially when she woofs in her sleep. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that brings me joy is on windy days like this, walking around somewhere where there's lots of flags and the way the flags just sort of snap back and forth in unison but and make that noise, that kind of snapping noise. It's just... Just like cleansing, it's like brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. You remind me of like those kind of fluffy things. I love those things. They're the best at the stoplight. Like so nothing has changed and everything has changed. It's so important for us to to notice that I know a lot of people, you know, right now the youth are out there on the anniversary of um, protests at universities getting arrested. And people are, I hear lots of people saying nothing has changed. And I'm like, and often I'm in a room like this. This is not a room that may have happened in the 60s, right? Or the 70s where there's a black person in the front, right? Or that we would even be in a space together. So just noticing what has changed 
right? That diversity is something that we're all engaged with to a certain extent. That as challenging as it is, there are LGBTQ people plus everywhere raising flags, right? And that there are a lot of allies supporting them, right? There's so many things that have changed and we have to refresh ourselves. So if you're like going to turn on the news and you feel that trauma, maybe research what good news is, what the good news is. Um, the, what I, the other thing that I encourage is that for every minute that you spend looking at the trauma and re-traumatizing yourself, that you spend the same amount of time on joy, that you spend the same amount of time watching those little, well, they're not that little, the rats who are taking care of the kittens or the lady that lives with the bee for the last few days of the bee's life. There are some beautiful things happening. Thousands of turtles, I might be exaggerating, a lot of turtles got saved and brought out of warm water into cold water over the last few weeks and just neighbors and people just bringing them in shoe boxes and all kinds of things. There are beautiful things happening. We're working on cleaning the oceans. We're working on things. So it's our responsibility to um, bring that to ourselves. So I'll stop talking and see if anybody wants to bring in any wisdom, if they have any questions, and hopefully you could find the love in my talk, even though I didn't talk too much about it. I find that the times that I'm really drawn towards the internet, <laughs> seeing what's going on, um, My even though I yeah, even though I know that there's nothing, there's nothing that's going to be joyful or helpful. It'll all be just look at how stupid those people are and look at how evil those people are. And I I know that that's what's awaiting me because that's all the sites I bookmark. Is it right? And so I just kind of like, and I find that when I'm drawn to it, it's because there's something like I'm feeling lonely or lost, or there's something going on inside of me that I can't quite face or tolerate. I'm not sure if it's grief or loneliness or rage or something, but there's something about having other people to be mad at yeah. that or to ridicule or something that makes me feel it doesn't really calm me down because afterwards I feel worse, but at the time I feel kind of like, you know, like I'm doing pretty good. I'm kind of self-righteous. I'm kind of, so I'm just like, I guess I'd love to find a way to open up to that, whatever it is that's I'm trying to get away from. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's my question sort of. Yeah. I mean, um, they're designed that way. I remember, Several years ago, I want to say maybe five, but you know, COVID's a whole decade, so I just time is weird. But um, several years ago, the um, one of the last presidents, and I guess another kind of CEO from Facebook, said that they never let their kids use the phone. Like they're designed for us to do exactly what you're doing, be external instead of internal. And in some ways, we might look at it like an addiction, the way that we automatically pick it up and we automatically go to it. And assuming that you're somewhere near my age, there was a time when we didn't have these pets, you know, and we were fine. We still had our shit, but um, stuff. But um and there were different ways that we had to deal with it. And maybe we didn't, maybe we went towards another addiction, but um, you can choose to um, unsubscribe. You have permission to unsubscribe. And, you know, what would it be to sit with it, to sit with how I'm feeling? Cause it'll pass or go somewhere else for, Entertainment, yeah.
Yeah, or I'm not going to, not entertainment, but um, comfort. Consolation, yeah, thanks. I got it, we all got it to a certain extent. Hi, yes. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear all of that, but the first thing I thought of when Tom was describing it is I have this really weird thing that I do when I get in the car. Like, I just get so judgmental about everyone. And it's not like road rage or something, but it's just like, oh, that was dumb. Oh, you're stupid. Why did you do that? Why don't you take care? And it's so funny. So I was driving between my house in Bernal and a, a friend's house in Diamond Heights. And um, I started noticing, like, why do I do this? Like, there's no, like, there's no reason. So I decided to just start counting how many times that reaction came up in me. And just from Bernal to 20, literally just down 29th Street and up six times, eight times. You know, I was doing it the trip uh, for about a week, a couple of times a day to take care of a friend's dog. And like literally, I could not get in the car without having like some like judgment about someone else. I don't, I didn't know where that, that's the best I thought to do was just recognize it, count it, you know, but I don't know what to do with that. That's weird. Like it's, it doesn't happen other places and spaces in my life. I remember distinctly coming up maybe Harrison heading towards the mission on 17th street and like oh my god people were moving so slow and then somebody cut me off and you know the new york is like what the you know and when i got two blocks up i think it was that car that was in an accident and i started and my first thought was oh that could have been me and I started looking at the incidents of people cutting me off as um, protection of some sort. And I started considering what it might be like if you really have to pee or if you're in an emergency running home to your child. You're... So I started taking in what could actually be going on. And then, because I'm still, I still have it a little bit with this, how hard is it can be to turn your signal on? But I started monitoring how often I forget to turn my signal on. Not a lot, I, uh, you know, I don't think. But um, yeah, it's, an, it's a wonderful space to practice compassion is in the car. You know, after a long retreat, they always say to us, oh, you're all lovey-dovey now. Wait till you get in your car, right? That's, yeah. And so, yeah, imagine if we didn't have that. And, and then noticing what's beneath it. Like, usually for me, I run late. I didn't curse anybody on the way here. I just got to say, I just prayed. And then I parked right across the street. So that's my karma, usually literally pulled up and then I couldn't pay, but so yeah, what's the compassionate response? Yeah. Yeah, but I get it. It's amazing how we can make up reasons to be mad. But usually it means something else is going on. Anyone else? Because we got a few minutes. Yes, please. Um, so I was so like grateful that you were um, speaking about Israel Palestine today because I'm having a bit of a like <laughs> a bit of a like political crisis, I guess, and I'm wondering if the Dharma can speak to it at all. Um, so I just came out of a weekend retreat at the University of British Columbia with Anushka, which was about the four elements and doing a lot of work around like interconnectedness and non-self. Um, and then I came out of that retreat and there was a call out for supporters of the students who are have an encampment there um, to support them because there was going to be a big counter protest. And so I went directly from, from that retreat 
to this highly charged situation. And I historically have approached politics from like a pretty um, intellectual place and a pretty, I like kind of came of age within some pretty radical communities. And so I find myself there in this um, really highly combative moment where both sides are yelling, yelling at each other. And I found myself like, I'm there supporting the students, but kind of unable to chant with them because it just felt like it was, it, as much as I support them and I do, it just felt like it was, we were just embodying war. Yeah. And, um, and I, I couldn't do it. There, there was just haunting back and forth. And I, and I, um, and I guess the reason why I felt like a bit of a crisis for me is, is on, on one sort of, um, the, the way that it felt so alienating and I felt so lonely from like a political community that has historically really felt like home. And as I deepen my practice with Buddhism, I start to feel more distant from that mm. and I don't know where I belong anymore. Mm. Um, so I'm a bit scared about what I'm learning in some ways because I'm worried I'll be alone. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you can yeah. if you can speak to that and also just like what now, how to how to work for justice if I don't want to fight yeah. anymore. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing and, and yeah, your thanks for listening. And your uh, passion, sharing your passion. Um, so I'd like you to first consider nothing to do right now, but what, what, so love is one of my pronouns, right? I spend all the time, not so much working to embodying it, but allowing it, because I believe that's what we all are. And so what that looks like for yourself might mean not going to places like that after a retreat, What's the line that anywhere or anywhere maybe, but then what does it look like for you now? And um, I think um, I don't know if you've heard of the Buddhist pre uh, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. So they have been practicing actions. And I think Tuesday mornings, there's a practice session and then um, there's a little mini Dharma talk and then uh, they might make phone calls or something, but it's all about connecting. And uh, there have been lots of interfaith uh, groups that are doing peaceful marches and not. So you're not gonna be alone. You're just shifting, you're just shifting. And, um, you know, uh, I often come back to Thich Nhat Hanh's story about, you know, you only need one person in the boat who's calm. And maybe your role is to sit on the side and meditate and ground so that you can call that energy in first for yourself, of course, and then for others. Right, so the, the work is for us to be what we want to see, be what we want to experience. So yeah, you're definitely not alone. Thanks for bringing it in and thanks for your passion. It's so hard, oh, yeah, that's a painful. Um, oh, it's seven o'clock. So we should close. I think next time I come, I almost always play music after. So next time I come, I'll send you a link and we can like close with a little song. So um, let us come down and... Oh, the other thing that's funny is that they keep... Oh, they rang the six o'clock bell late. Did anybody notice that? Oh, you can't hear the church bell, but they've been ringing it late. This, they're on time now. But I was like, you guys are late. <laughs> All right. Just coming into our cells for a moment. In my mind, a lot of the words and topics are swirling around a little bit. 
then the offers, if you're having some of that experience or whatever's going on for you, that you can be with it with ease. Right? There's even equanimity and joy, right? Not to get too carried away with anything, but just noticing what's going on for you. And in honor of this sacred space that we created, for those of you who have it to spare, first for yourself, and then, if possible, for all beings everywhere, without exception, may all beings be safe and free from inner and outer harm. May all beings experience and be offered empathy and compassion and care. May all beings understand that they are loved with each inhale and that they are already enough. May all beings be peace and be free. Thank you so much for your practice and your presence and, and sharing your joy. May you go out and do that more often. <laughs>